Hello, I'm Donna Scale. And I'm Tiffany Ross. Welcome to Roaring Lambs. We're a show that provides moving stories of faith. Everybody's got a story. And we want to bring you stories where you can see how real Jesus is to us. So uh, let me ask you, do you have a master plan for your life? Uh, maybe, maybe not, but we're going to introduce you to a man today who knows exactly what his plan is, what he's been called to do, and he's doing and executing it beautifully. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss this show. This episode of Roaring Lambs is brought to you by LifeStoriesCompany.com. Dr. Tolson uh, knows exactly what he's been called to do. He's been called to make disciples that will make disciples. Mm -hmm. He developed a beautiful plan that works perfectly in churches, Bible studies, small groups. I know because I went through it. Mm -hmm. He assigned to me uh, young, a younger a DTS student, Dallas Theological uh, Seminary student, and for 28 years, weeks we engaged about a different topic every week that grew us closer to the Lord. Now when he first assigned this seminary student to me I thought seminary student she's going to know so much more about the Bible and about God than maybe I do but you know it's not true. It was so beautiful how God made that union work. My life experiences helped make her Bible study real, and her Bible study helped me see how God worked mm, in my life. Good. It's a beautiful program. It's called The Four Priorities. Uh, you might have watched uh, Punky Tulson's show. She's unliftable as well, and she has a beautiful story, and she talks about her husband, John, in that story. So this is John. He has been a... Uh, uh, chaplain uh, to many sports teams, in including the Houston Rockets, the Houston Astros, Houston Oilers, and the Dallas Cowboys. He's uh, authored several books, and uh, I just don't want to waste any more time. I want you to hear Dr. John Tolson's story. So, uh, welcome to our show. We're Great so happy to, to have you. And uh, we'd love for you to start at the beginning of your story. Tell us a little bit about your childhood and your upbringing. Well, I was born, first of all, at a very early age. Um, <laughs> no, just joking. Uh, I grew up in a pretty dysfunctional family. And uh, my real father uh, and my mom were divorced when I was two. Mm. I think it was around two. And uh, that leaves a hole in your heart. You don't know yes. it at the time. But later on, as you grow up a little bit, you something's missing. A stepdad came in my life when I was about, I think, seven. He had no idea how to be a dad. And I love sports, and he didn't like sports. In fact, he literally put down uh, me and the whole idea of playing what he called ball, whatever ball it was. So it was, it was a tough ride coming, coming along. Um, so that's basically how I grew up in a, in, a, in a family that was struggling and didn't have a lot uh, as far as money or nice homes. Um, so that was the basic environment mm -hmm. that I lived in kind of growing up until I got out of high school. Yeah. And I know that oftentimes many of us don't have ideal home situations yeah. as you just described. Sure. Um, but God is faithful, even when we don't realize it at the time, to put people into our lives to pour into us. Mm -hmm. And God saw fit to uh, put an uncle in your life that was influential mm -hmm. and a, just a good guy. Could you explain mm -hmm. some of that interaction with him growing up? Yeah, sure. I, I, he, was the, he was a great athlete. This was in Ohio. And he drilled me, even as a young guy, uh, and don't drink Cokes, because that'll cut your wind. Caffeine, you don't want that. Sit up straight at the table. Work me out like crazy. 
but no one else was taking time with me. And what we did was important, but probably what really touched me the most, especially as I look back, was he was just with me. We spent time together. Mm -hmm. But before that, going back before that, um, I, um, I knew if I was going to be able to um, go to school, go to college, uh, it was going to require some financial assistance or a scholarship or something. My family, I'm literally, they had nothing. We barely got by. And my uncle, talking about the spiritual side, he really didn't help me spiritually. He didn't know God from Donald Duck. <laughs> and, but he was a big athlete, and I loved my uncle. And anyway, so um, when it came uh, to my senior year in high school, I was around Christmas time, and his name was Denzel. And he came uh, to Florida, he was living in Ohio, where we were living at the time in Florida, and we were visiting one night. And he said, well, do you have any scholarship offers yet? And I said, well, how do you get a scholarship offer? He said, well, your coaches should be helping you. I said, well, we're a big football school, and I know the coaches are helping them. And even though our basketball program, which is what I played, uh, was a good one and really coming along great, uh, nobody was helping us. So he said, oh, you have a dictionary? Yeah, I said, yes, I got a dictionary. Um, so I went to my closet, and I had this little paperback Webster. He said, go downstairs, come back in 30 minutes, I'll have a plan. I had no idea what he was going to come up with. So I come, why do you want the dictionary? So I come back <laughs> upstairs, and he said, all right, sit down. He goes to the back of the dictionary, and it's got all the colleges and universities mentioned in the country. He would put 50 dots by 50 schools. And he said, all right, and he goes over each one of them. Here's how they are academically, athletically. So get out a piece of paper, we're gonna write you a letter. He was dictating, I was writing. So he told me what to write. My name's John Tolson. I go to Manatee High School, Bradenton, Florida. My grade point <coughs> average is. Uh, he said, uh, uh, last year in baseball, my pitching record was. This year in basketball, I'm averaging this many points. And then um, he said, I want to come, say, I want to come to your school, but I'll need a full scholarship. Sign, John Tolson. He said, and I write 50 of them. <laughs> now, I'm talking no typewriter, no, no. Nah. So I cash in Pepsi and Coke bottles. You get a nickel a bottle, and I got the paper, I got the envelopes, and I got the stamps. And over the next couple uh, weeks, I literally copied that 50 times, stuck it in the mailbox, and I am glad I'm done with that. Never believing anything would come out of it. So in about two or three months, I started getting letters. And they either offer me a half scholarship or our roster is full if you're free. Uh, next season, we'd like to look at you and have you come try out. I finally got a, a, a call from a coach in South Carolina, and he said, would you come up and try out? So I got on a Trailways bus, went eight hours up <laughs> and worked out. And when it was the workout was finished, he said, we'd like for you to come and we'll give you a scholarship. But it was a junior college. I have nothing against junior college, but that's only two years. So I'm thinking on my eight hour, hour drive back on the bus, I've got to have four years. What if I get hurt? What if I don't get picked up after the two years? I got to get my school. Nobody in my family ever went past the 10th grade. Mm -hmm. Our family wasn't a highly motivated family. So that's what I grew up in. So to, over the years to become motivated, where'd that come from? <laughs> I think I know where it is, but anyway, um, so uh, I'm back in Florida, now it's baseball season, and I'm going to uh, baseball practice one afternoon, and I always called my mom, mom, to get any letters today? Well, this day, she said, well, there's something here from Arizona, Flagstaff, Arizona, Northern Arizona University. I said, I don't even remember writing them. So she, uh, I said, would you open it up? She opened it up. And this is how it read. I have this in my scrapbook. Hmm. You have been granted a full four-year scholarship, play basketball and baseball at Northern Arizona University. Sign. Yay. So, yeah, that's, that's a big deal. Yeah. And uh, so I get on a trailways bus that uh, fall and go three days and three nights on the bus. And they threw my trunk out on the ground and it was like 30 degrees, because that's almost 6,000 feet up in Flagstaff. 
I didn't know where the school was. I hadn't seen a picture of the school. I had never been anywhere, <laughs> and here I am. <laughs> but that's how I got to college. And I think the, just the fact that even though my uncle really didn't know the Lord, didn't have any, yes. uh, any uh, use for that as, at that point in his life, God still used a pagan person that I love to help me move ahead in whatever was going to be planned for me from the Lord. Pretty crazy deal. Yeah, as we talked about, we don't always know our plans even, no. but God knows his plans he sure and does. he just lets them unravel yeah, yeah. in a way that's really good for us. Yeah, you know, it's sad. I know so many people that that don't have a plan for their lives and mm -hmm. or purpose because I blame right. I think the plan brings the purpose and they're just kind of drifting along mm -hmm. and that's, that's a tough deal. And the Lord used another uh, young, young man to help you in your direction and, yeah. fall, and finding Christ. Sure. Would you, you tell bet. us a little well, bit about that? Yeah, that again, I'll have to go back. Uh, I was getting ready to go into the 10th grade in high school. And I had a buddy named Sherry Hadley. And Sherry Hadley uh, invited me to a weekend youth retreat. I didn't know what a retreat was. I was thinking the Calvary's coming over the hill. <laughs> retreat, what's that? <laughs> So uh, he said, no, it's going to be a lot of people you know from the school. We'll probably have 150 kids, guys and gals, and good food, a good time to play ball. And he didn't tell me everything about this place, but uh, he said, that's what it'll be. So I said, sign me up. Man, if there are going to be girls there and we're going to eat, I said, I'm and play ball, I'm ready. So on the last night of that week-long deal, it wasn't a weekend, it was a week-long deal, the man that was speaking Every night I was just fooling around the back, talking to friends and cutting up. And that last night he started talking about Jesus, about the cross, what Jesus did on the cross. And I mean, even as I'm telling you this right now, a chill runs through me because the Lord grabbed me somehow, some way in my attention. And I listened to every word that he said. And I think what the Lord use in that at that moment was, I, I said, why in the world would somebody do that for me? I don't deserve that. Mm -hmm. And he kind of went through the details of what he went through before he even got to the cross. So that night I, I uh, led by him, I, le I asked Christ to come into my life. And I mean, people ask me a lot of times, says, why are you so excited about Christ and coming to Christ? I said, I can't get over the fact that he loves me. I can't get over the fact of what he's done for me. And so that, yeah. So I'll finish the story. There is some more. I forgot about that. And so uh, college goes by, and I'm in graduate school, and I get a phone call one day that my buddy, who had taken me to that retreat, Sherry Hadley, had died. Mm -hmm. He was in, the, in Vietnam and was killed. So um, I thought, started thinking, man, what if he hadn't uh, asked me to go? Mm -hmm. He probably didn't even know the importance of what he did just by inviting me someplace. Yeah. So a number of years later, I was with a friend and we were in Washington and we were going to the airport, Reagan Airport, and um, he said, have you ever seen the Vietnam Memorial? I said, I've never seen it. So he says, ask the cab driver to pull over. We get out, walk through this grassy area, and if you've been there, you'll Remember that you come up to this uh, place where you can look up names of people on the wall and then you can walk down uh, the walkway and find their name on the wall. Mm. So I looked through it and finally there it was, Sherry Hadley, Bradenton, Florida. Mm. Nobody talks, by the way, when you're at the Vietnam Memorial. It, nobody's laughing, nobody's cutting up, it's very somber. So I walk down the walk, walkway and finally came to that portion of the wall where his name was supposed to be. And I go down the names and then boom, there it was, mm. Sherry Hadley. And one of the points, I'll be eternally grateful for him, but here's one of the points. I think people in our day and time, as they really think uh, about if they could live their life over again, one of the things they would say is, I wish I would have done more things that would outlast me once I'm dead and gone. He did that, died at 22, had no idea what the Lord was going to do in and through my life over these years. Mm -hmm. So it all goes back to somebody that cared enough, so you right. need to go to this deal. Mm -hmm. 
You're right, because I often think, what if yeah. Cecil Kemp hadn't invited me into his <coughs> office to yeah. have that talk with me, knowing my background and knowing the need in my life, yeah. what would have happened if he never had that talk with me? Yeah, that's right. So um, I was glad at one point yeah. I realized that man hmm. changed my whole life. Of course, it was Jesus that changed my whole life, yeah. but he's the one who told me about Jesus. <clears throat> I wrote a letter to him. Oh. And I thanked him for what he had done. He might not have even remembered what that conversation that he had with yeah, me. But he, he understood, <coughs> yeah. and yes. that, I'll guarantee he loved hearing from you. Yeah, so maybe, maybe this whole conversation is about you writing a letter to somebody mm -hmm. who led you to Christ mm -hmm. and telling them, thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you for the difference that you made in my life. That's right. That's but right. we have a lot of great stories to talk about in your life. I, I know that uh, you met the love of your life, Ruth Ann, at some point, and tell us about Ruth Ann. Yeah, Ruth Ann uh, was, uh, grew up in my hometown, Bradenton, Florida, which is right below Tampa, 40 miles mm -hmm. on the west coast. Her father was uh, one of the first nine doctors in Bradenton. In fact, the hospital's named after him now. He, I think he delivered almost 4,000 babies. Oh, wow. Dr. Harris was absolutely one of the finest men I've ever known in my life. But I met her one day, and we dated for a couple years, and she w had graduated from Florida State University, and I was in graduate school. Uh, but at, at the, that the, when the time was right, <laughs> uh, I asked her if she would marry me, and thankfully she said yes. Mm -hmm. She was an amazing lady. Um, we might, might talk about punking a, a moment. Mm -hmm. They were different personalities, uh, but Ruth Ann was very thoughtful, very a very deep thinker. Uh, she, um, when she spoke, you listened. That kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, not the punky people don't listen, but she was just of that personality and temperament. So I remember so many things that she taught me uh, early on. I was talking about this the other day to somebody. When I was in graduate school on the weekends, these little churches around Georgia would call and ask us to come, ask me to come preach, well she would go along with me and you'd usually get a chicken dinner afterward <laughs> and, and some little thing they gave you. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember I had one sermon, that's all I had. And that's what I gave every time. <laughs> and she heard it many times, <laughs> so this was great. So we're, we're lying uh, in the bed one night uh, talking and reading and all of a sudden it gets quiet. She memorized this, this sermon, she memorized it. And this is how it starts, and this is what she said with her eyes closed. It was a hot, dry, dusty day. <laughs> that was the opening to the thing. She was saying to me, you need to get another one. Come on, that's a good one. You got a hot, dry, dusty sermon is what That's right, exactly. Uh -huh. But one of the other two things that she really, other than just loving me and, and been a great, great partner, uh, she said, but, so when I would speak, a lot of times I would use my verbs incorrectly. And on the way back to Atlanta, she would say, you need to work on that. <laughs> and I didn't want to hear that. I said, well, that's just me. That's how I am. I, you know, I make up my own vocabulary. But anyway, <laughs> uh, but she said, you know, one day you may be speaking to a sophisticated group of people that need to know Jesus. Yes. And you need to get that right. Mm. Never did I know some of the things the Lord's allowed me to do. Mm -hmm. Like speaking in, in Minnesota a number of years ago to 62,000 dads on how wow. to be a great daddy. Mm -hmm. So she, that paid off. And the other one, mm. uh, she said, my, my folks didn't teach me this. Listen, when somebody does something for you, you got to write a thank you note. <laughs> What's oh, a thank you note? I said, no, you get, you. I said, okay. So. I would write these little notes and she called them flashcards because I look at one or two lines and thank you, John. <laughs> so anyway, she, uh, she, when she was about 28, found out she was a diabetic mm -hmm. and started taking insulin. Uh, and it didn't slow her down. She really took care of herself, uh, good shape, worked out, everything. But uh, in 1995, uh, at the age of about, I think she was 52 then, uh, she had a stroke, mm -hmm. and it was around the thalamus part of the brain, and that's where uh, the gizmo is that tells you 
uh, and, and you get the perception of what's hot or cold. Well, her, she mm -hmm. told me, if you cut my body in right down the middle, everything on the left side is like somebody has a hot iron on it 24 hours a day. Mm. Oh, wow. So that was the four, la four last years of her life. Mm. And we got medication, and, but you know, she's drugged up. She, she's not, you're not normal. We had gone to a doctor uh, in North Carolina at Duke, and he had agreed to do this operation. But uh, like a week or two later, uh, she passed away. She had another stroke. So it was so hard for my kids to see that. Uh, my son was living at home. My daughter uh, was getting ready to get married and in fact did get married before she passed away. And that was one of her dreams and goals. She mm -hmm. prayed, Lord, just let me be able to get up and walk and get going again. I want to be able to walk down that aisle. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget standing in this big church where we were doing the, the service and uh, there was on the back, there was some doors or glass, little round glass uh, windows that you look, could look through to see what's going on in the sanctuary. And I never forget when she walked down that aisle because I knew the pain, mm. I knew the hurt, <laughs> I knew the, some of the things that were rumbling around her heart. So it was a, it was a powerful time. Mm. Can I say something that sure. just stood out to me so profoundly when you said that? Here you are, been married for a long while now, you and Ruth Ann, and you are still her groom, mm -hmm. watching this bride come yeah. down. Yes. Yeah. You know, after all those years, knowing the pain that she's mm -hmm. in, and what a moving time, I can only imagine. Mm -hmm. And so what a gift that God gave you in yeah. her. And no it's doubt. not often that people have one wonderful, happy marriage, but God's blessed you with another wonderful mm -hmm. lady. Well, I never knew or thought, or it, I didn't know if I was ever gonna get married again. I really didn't think about it a lot. Mm -hmm. I really focused on my work and spending more time with my kids that first year after she went to be with the Lord. But um, they called up, my kids called up one day and said, I don't think mom would want you not to be married. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that kind of freed me up to be open to it. Yes. So then I had friends that started lining me up with people and I met some great ladies, but I knew in one day, probably like they did too, this was right or wrong. <laughs> So um, anyway, finally, um, my veterinarian, Fred Hall, called and said, we got somebody you need to meet. We've been holding, holding back on her. <laughs> Why you been holding back? Now, this guy was really funny, Fred Hall, Dr. Fred Hall. So uh, Punky and I met and dated for well over a year. And I've, there's a lot of details here. Sometimes we just like to tell all the intricacies of that dating and that story. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can do that sometime. But, um, Anyway, we've been married 20 years now. We had our anniversary last week in North Carolina. Uh, and Punky, I look at Punky and I look at Ruth Ann, both amazing people. And you all are getting to know her. You yeah, understand yes. she's really an amazing person. But uh, she, uh, she, and I, one of the things I love about her, I love that she loves the Lord. Yes. I love that she loves me. And I love so many of the, the things about her. She's strong. I mean, if, if she's me, she's, I need to be, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, boy. <laughs> well, I, and as we talked about on her show. Oh, did she? Okay. W yes, and she was 43. She had yeah. never been married. Right. Uh, had always dreamed of a fairy book marriage, uh, and God held her back and held her back, knowing that uh, he had some things to get in line before yep. you were available. Yep. Yep. And uh, I'm so happy for you because Thank you, you make a beautiful And she couple. literally lived five houses away and I didn't know it. <laughs> yeah, that's what she's told us. So one of my buddies um, in Austin, I called him from Orlando and I said, David, I just want you to know, Punky and I are gonna get married. And he had met Punky, but he knew, knew Ruth Ann. He said, wait, hold you a second. Now we love Ruth Ann. Are you telling me you think God can give you two good wives when some of us never get one good one? <laughs> he was kidding, yeah. but anyway. Mm. Well, yeah, so she's you. a home run. So mm. yes. two great, two great people. Mm. So let's talk about your work. How did God put this desire in your heart? Well, you might not know how, but tell us about this desire 
with discipling people who will disciple others. Yeah. Well, let me go back just a little bit. Yes. When I graduated from college, I was going to coach. I signed a, co a contract to coach in a college in Mississippi. And the summer before I started doing that, I was working with students in my home church in Florida, seeing kids, high school kids, come to Christ like crazy. And, and inside, I was in turmoil. I said, I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Not coaching, although I love coaching. Would have loved that, I think. So anyway, long story short, I went to graduate school or seminary. Um, and then for the next 16 years, I worked with uh, high school kids uh, in three different locations around the country, last being here in Dallas. Um, but what I started seeing through all of that and those years of this, adults coming to Christ, kids coming to Christ, that it's kind of like a, a, a lady has, is in the hospital and she, she has a baby and the baby's healthy, mama's healthy, but two or three days later she comes out and puts a little Jimmy on the steps of the hospital and says, I carried you for nine months and everything's good with you now. Hope everything works out. <laughs> but that's often what happens right. with people that come to know Christ. <clears throat> Nobody takes them on. They've got zillions of questions and they get lost sometimes in these big churches or sometimes doesn't have to be a big church and nobody takes them on mm -hmm. and, and, and really helps them get a what I call a faith foundation built under their life that they can live by but then build on the rest of their lives. Mm -hmm. So I've, I have, uh, through the study of scripture and especially Matthew 28 and 2 Timothy 2.2, uh, and through several people over the years that uh, had huge impacts in my life in terms of disciple making. I went to seminary and there wasn't one course offered in what Jesus said to do in Matthew 28 to go make disciples. Not one, not one course was offered. Mm -hmm. But he brought other people in my life that, were, that understood the importance of that and showed me how to do it and what to do and so that's when it kind of caught fire. Mm -hmm. Then, a number of years ago, when I was in Orlando, a group of people in Dallas asked if we would be open, Punk and I would be open to move to, to Dallas. And I, I said, what do you want me to do? And they told me what they wanted me to do. And for a year, we prayed about that. And finally, I was getting ready to call and say, nope, I'm, I, I, I'm not getting the, the nod. I don't think I'm supposed to come. I was in my office and in 20 minutes made the decision. And here was the question that I had not covered to this point. I said, so John, where do you feel like over the years God's used you the most? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't any of the big deals where I spoke, et cetera, or working on all those sports teams as much as I loved that. But what came to my heart and mind was wherever I lived, the handful of people I deeply discipled and got them ready to disciple others who then could disciple others to try to do what Jesus said to do. So I called the people that were asking me to come and said, uh, let me come over and tell you where I am, how I've come to this conclusion. I came over and they got excited about it. I said, well, we'll come if you'll help us get started. So that's really what we do. We, we are trying to help uh, churches and pastors and leaders and lay people, men and women all over the country to understand what it means to be a disciple and what it means to make disciples. Right. And we think, I think, and others do too, that it is the greatest missing piece to churches in America. Mm -hmm. So that's a short version of it. No, I, I agree because so many people when they come to Christ like you said, they get thrown into yep. a church, maybe a Bible study, mm -hmm. but there's so much more in your book, The Four Priorities, yeah. that really just lays a solid foundation yeah. on how you re should respond about every different thing sure. that you're going to learn about. Well, let me great. tell you a story, if, if you don't mind. Yes. So um, my, my pastor, Richard Ellis, uh, is a pastor of an inner city church here in town, downtown Dallas. And if he were here, this is what he would tell you. He's a sixth generation Baptist preacher. Um, was at Dallas, or a seminary in Fort Worth, Southwestern. And he was just about ready to graduate. And this was what was going through his mind and heart. I, I know I came to Jesus when I was very young, but this whole, my whole life, it's just not working. 
something's wrong. So, and he would tell you this with tears in his eyes. So he said, Lord, if you don't give me somebody, I'm not gonna make it. He's 28 years old. He goes to Jackson, Mississippi, is in a meeting with a bunch of folks, looks across the room. This older man is looking at him. He has no idea who this man is. Man comes over and says, hi, I'm Claude. He said, well, I'm Richard. He said, let's go outside and talk. Three hours later, the old man said, well, Richard, let me tell you what I do. I take people on. In other words, disciple. But his way of saying it was, I'll take you on. Mm -hmm. So for three years they met. And Richard Ellis would tell you right now, I would not be here today wow. if it weren't for what that man did for me. Mm -hmm. but, here's the, but here is the clincher. He said he gave me two things. No one, no pastor, no seminary professor, even my own family. He gave me two things no one ever gave me. Number one, he gave me truth and he gave me time. Mm -hmm. Not truth and no time, not time and no truth. And it changed his life. And I think that's what people are craving. Yes. There are so many people sitting in pews. If somebody would just wrap their arms around them, begin to walk with them and help them grow and develop and answer their questions and believe in them as Christ does, yes. it's a different world, mm -hmm. different ball game. And you have, well, not just your whole ministry has really been pouring into people and God bless you for that because I think oftentimes we can just be selfish and yeah. narrow-minded and <clears throat> sure. we don't think of other people and what they might need. But you have a really powerful story where you shared the Lord with an atheist and what mm -hmm. transpired there. Well, we have a luncheon we do here in Dallas called the Gathering of Men Luncheon. Mm -hmm. And about 250, 300 men come. And after one of these a few years ago, um, a buddy came up and said, I want you to meet my, my, my guest today. His name's Rob. So Rob and I were talking. He said, you mind if I come by and see you sometime? I said, no. So a couple weeks later, he came in. We're sitting in my office. And he said, well, this is not about me. It's about my dad. I said, tell me about your dad. So well, my dad lives in Charlottesville, Virginia. He went to the University of, G of Virginia. He's brilliant said he's 70 years old, he's got cancer, and he's an atheist. And he said, what's breaking my heart is, if things end up like they are right now, he's gonna be in one place and I'm gonna be in another one. I want us to be together. So I said, you tell your daddy uh, that I'll fly up there next week. I don't know him, you'll have to open the door for me, but I love guys like that. And uh, I'm serious about it. I'll go up Monday and spend a couple days with him. So on Monday, he sent me an email and said, talk to my dad. He said, well, Rod, I don't know what this is about, but if it's that important, I'll come to Dallas. So on Tuesday at 10.15, I had an appointment up to about 10.10, these two guys walk in, Bob the dad and Rob the son. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, sometimes these people that are coming from an atheistic background, they can be really tough people, mm -hmm. negative, all that stuff. <laughs> this guy was delightful. And so we sat down and visited for a while, and then I said to him, and uh, you'll need to let me know how much detail you want and give me the cut <laughs> sign, but uh, I said, Bob, why are you here? He said, I'm here because my son asked me to come, and I love my son. Good answer. Um, what do you believe? He said, well, I, I guess I would have to say I believe in the inherent goodness of mankind. I started laughing. And I said, well, obviously you don't know some of the mankind I know. <laughs> so he said, well, you're probably right about that. I said, okay, Bob, do you believe there's a God? Puts his head down, comes back up, not sure about that one. I said, okay, now I know where to start. So what I did was I said, the question we need to talk about for a moment is, how do we get here? The question of existence. So I went through that, I said, there are only three possible answers. One, that everything that exists has always existed and, and came out of absolutely nothing. And I hit the wall, I said, pretend that's a black blackboard. What this theory says, everything just popped out. But nobody who's a thinking person holds to that because it doesn't give you answers to specific questions. Why am I the way I am, et cetera, et cetera. Second possible answer is time plus chance equals existence. And this, would wear, this is where you would find Darwin, so we talked about him a while, and that was intriguing. 
I said, do you know when Darwin died, uh, he died depressed? And he told some people that were there, I've always believed that we came from a, a simple life form like an earthworm. And he said, but what bothers me is how can I trust myself to come up with a theory that explains the existence of mankind if I came from an earthworm? Mm. And they did say he died depressed. Third possible answer, there's a personal beginning. Now Bob had never heard this before. I'm surprised he didn't hear, hear the first two. But anyway, I said, per, I said you flew over here from, from uh, Charlottesville, and you came that beautiful country, Charlottesville, Virginia. And you flew down over Arkansas, begins to flatten out a little bit. Then you come into DFW, boom, it's like the top of that table, flat. <laughs> so let me ask you a question. If there, if, if, if there were a God that made all this, what would he have to be like? He said, well, he'd have to be powerful. He'd have to be intelligent. He would have to be creative. He would have to somehow communicate. So, Bob, let me ask you a question. Can you communicate? He said, well, my wife argues about how good I'm at that. I, he said, I feel I'm pretty creative. I got a creative streak in me. And he said, um, I, um, I think I'm pretty smart. I'm grateful for that, I'm pretty smart. So I said, Bob, do you realize, in this book, and I had a Bible sitting in front, I said, there's this book called the Bible, there's a, a verse that says that we have been made in the image of God after his likeness we have been made. Do you realize that what you said God would have to be like and what you're like is a match? <laughs> he did not know what to say. He just sat back. This brilliant 70-year-old man. So I said, all right, let's move on. Uh, and I said, so here's the question, Bob. Is there any hope? Now, this is what broke my heart. Here's a man, 70 years old, got cancer, and he had no answer for me, no hope. So I said, all right, let me tell you, let me tell you something here, Bob, real quickly. I said, uh, why is the world like it is today? He said, it's just messed up. I said, you're right. Let me tell you why. In the very beginning, this God that made us, late, these first people that came into existence, he set them up in a perfect environment. Everything, everything they would ever need was provided. Didn't have a lot of rules, just had one rule, and there was a purpose for the rule. And I said, one day, basically, they decided they wanted to break the rule. They broke the rule. Four things happened to them that all through the years have come down to us that have impacted all of us uh, on this planet. Number one, they were cut off from God, unplugged. Number two, they were cut off from themselves. That's why people struggle, and many people watching this, people struggle with feeling okay about themselves, their significance, their worth, because when you're unplugged from the God who made you, who gives you worth, you're lost. Number three, it cut them off from other people. That's why we have wars. That's why we have, uh, have to sign contracts with a lawyer. We can't just give our word. And then the fourth thing is everything in creation has been thrown off kilter. Now we have tsunamis, we have hurricanes, we have horrific accidents. And then I looked at him and I said, then we also have germs and people get cancer. Mm -hmm. So is there any answer, Bob? Seems to be somehow, some way, it's getting plugged back in the one that made us, that knows how we tick, that wired us up, that that's, that's the issue. So I said, you like football? He said, I love football. <laughs> and by the way, the NFL and college is starting this weekend, and so this is a very appropriate. So I said, how many downs in football? He said, four downs. All right, down one. God looked down. The Bible said he looked down, saw the mess, saw the rebellion, and he said, I regret I even made them. First book of the Bible, Genesis 6. And he could have turned his back, Bob, on us and said, you had it too good. I'm out of here. But he didn't. That goes to the second down. Second down is that Jesus came down. Because God knew that in order to relate to people, he had to be a people. He had to be a person. So he put skin on. Jesus lived here for 33 years, never messed up one time, always did what the Father wanted him to do. He healed people. He helped people. He taught people, but that wasn't the main reason he came. That goes the third down. 
and I'm drawing little diagrams with him while I'm doing this. I said, the third down is Jesus laid down his life on the cross. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you know why he did that? He said, well, I've heard of it, but I don't, know, I don't understand it. I said, let me tell you why. The Bible says for all of sin and come short of what God expects. The Bible also says the wages of sin is death. There's a penalty. Either we pay it by dying someday and being separated from him forever, or if there's another plan and God had the plan, and his plan was to allow his son, perfect son, to go on a cross, and he put the penalty, I'm due, you're due, on him. I said, Bob, I'm making it as simple as I can. That's the deal. But there's a fourth down. The fourth down is we've got to come to a point in our lives where we cry uncle and give up and we're willing to bow down mm -hmm. before him and say, Lord, there's no way I can make it. There's no way, in light of what I've just learned, if this is true, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened, and I want in on it. Mm -hmm. So I said, Bob, as we closed up, I said, Bob, I said, what do you think? Well, he didn't know what to think, <laughs> but, but I knew he was a thinker and it was getting through. So I got my pad out and I drew a circle. I said, Bob, if this is you, and I put a cross outside the circle, and that's what, everything I've just told you about Christ and who he was and what he did, where would he be in relationship to you? He said, well, he's out there. I said, Bob, let me tell you how this works. He's got to be in here. And the way he gets in there, he doesn't barge his way in. He says, you got to invite me in. may sound crazy, but that's the way it works. And so uh, I'm going to have a little prayer. And if you would like to ask Christ into your life, and I had, if you just want to snooze for a minute during the prayer, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So I bowed my head, and there was a card table, not a card table, but a, a table in front of us, and then they were sitting on the other side. And so I prayed a little prayer, Lord, come into my life now, clean me up, and, and help me to become the person you've always want me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So I raised up and I looked over and they still had their heads bowed. And I was, I'll tell you what I was thinking. Those suckers went to sleep on me. And I read over, I said, Bob, 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 <laughs> did you pray that prayer? And very slowly his head came up with big tears coming mm. down his cheeks and all he could do was. Mm. Well, his son is very, very emotional. And here he is seeing his father come to Christ so he's crying, and they're standing up. They're hugging each other. And I said, Bob, you know what? You came in here dead, and you're walking out alive. Mm. He died four it's months later. Oh, wow. And um, Bob, Rob, his son, did the funeral. And he said, what do I do? I said, just tell him what happened. Tell him that story. That's all you need to do. Because most of the people that came to the funeral uh, did not, were not followers of Christ. Mm. So that's it. Wow. Oh, I got a question. Those people out there, if that's you, and this is Jesus, where is he in relationship to you? Is he out there? Like a guy told me, oh, he's getting closer. Closer doesn't have, count to anything but horseshoes. He's got to be in you. So you might want to do what my dear friend did a short time we knew each other, but he made that bold step and asked Christ to come in his life. And that's the, that, that, everything changes when that happens. Some of you say, well, I've done that, but I'm not sure. I think he's there. Well, then maybe you need to pray the in case prayer. Lord, I think you're there, but in case you're not, come on in. He doesn't play spiritual hopscotch. Once he's in, he's in. So make sure that you can seal the deal that he's in your life and you're following him. And do I have time to read a verse? Yes, you do. Okay. For people, there's so many people, and we were talking about this earlier, in our country, sitting in churches, they think they're set. Well, we need to make sure we're set, but listen to this one set of verses in Matthew 7. Jesus says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will come into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then, then will I declare to them, I never knew you. 
There's going to be a lot of people shocked because they maybe prayed a little prayer. But did you hear what he said? The ones who are really, really with it here and really belong to me, they do what I want them to do. They do what the book says. They do his will. And that's a, that's a powerful thing we all need to mm-hmm. reflect on and think about. Right. And I pray that you take so seriously what mm-hmm. John just said. And if you've never invited him in, do it now. Mm-hmm. Just do it right now in your own words, in your own way. Just yeah. invite him into your life. <coughs> Excuse me. If you would like to reach out to John, he'd love to talk to you. He'd love to connect with you. You can reach him at info at the Tolson group mm-hmm. dot com. Yep. Shoot him an email. Say he's in. Mm-hmm. I invited him in. Let him right. know that what he shared with mm-hmm. you made a difference in your life. That would bless him tremendously. If you want to know more about the gathering, the men's group that he does, if you want to know more about the four priorities, mm-hmm. maybe you want to know how to start a group, reach out to John. Info at the Tolson Group dot com. And Tiffany and I thank you for watching today. We'd love to hear from you as well. Yeah. You can reach out to us at info at roaringlambs.org. If you know Jesus, mm. make a difference. Mm. Go out and share him with someone else. Roar about the goodness mm. of God. At Life Stories Company, our passion is to preserve your story in a personal memoir. These beautiful books can be shared with both friends and family for generations. For the past 28 years, we have helped over 200 clients share their history and wisdom. As a Christian, what better testimony than to share how God has led you and provided for you? Visit us at lifestoriescompany.com. Sharing your story and honoring God, lifestoriescompany.com.